Dr. Mastermind was like uh, Motorhead, my favorite band, with Ingve on guitar. That's how some reviewers say, and how people say this today. Speed metal with a shredding guitar player. In fact, the guy that played guitar, Kurt James, was the guy that replaced Ingve in the band Steeler. And the, Mike Varney sent me Paul Gilbert, and it, uh, he was really a Van Halen guy, and he wasn't. He had his own thing going, and uh, so and the guys that I brought him from Portland, none of them were even close to the world class guys that he could send me. So I went with Kurt and uh, Gene Castronovo, Dean, the big Dean with two E's, and uh, you know he was our drummer in Wild Dogs and. And he's always, you know, he's my friend first. We we played with, we did the Malice demos before he joined Wild, before he came over and destroyed Jamie St. James' drum set. And uh, they, and I talked the other guys into, I basically forced him into the band. And once they realized his worth, then it was like, oh, well, you know, he's he's our fan. Oh, he's our friend. And so... Part of the deal was that uh, if you can get Dean Castronovo to play on the record, we can move him down here and I can get him a paid gig with Tony McAlpine and a bunch of session work with shrapnel artists. And I thought, okay. So he added more money to my budget. I had a guy with a truck, and uh, they loaded up the truck and took all of his stuff down when we did the, the uh, photo shoot. See, Kurt James and I were down there before. We did the... Uh, the basic tracks already with the drums and bass and uh, Ron Chick was a rhythm guitar player which he was a little bent out of shape because he thought he was like the next Ingve guy and Randy Rhodes and you know people who had already done something but Mike Varney was a guy who was finding the next bunch of people and he was from uh, copying the other guys okay thanks Ron it, I don't think your tracks are on the album but because Kurt did all the he redid all the rhythms and, uh, well, we, uh, we recorded the basics in Portland and the guy that owned the studio and the engineer, Rick McMillan was a friend of Jeff's and, uh, I, he, he knew how much of a budget we had and he was going to try to go over that. And we could have done that whole record for the, the amount of money we spent at the studio with Rick. And, uh, I mean, the drum solo, he said, oh, did you want me to record that? I was like, yeah, you dummy. Yeah, who you calling a dummy, dummy? Um, <laughs> speaking of dummies, the album cover was really weird to do because I was, uh, you know, it was all Mike's, uh, Mike's ideas, concept, and I think it was kind of like, you know, the puppet master. And so he has this collection. He has a lot of collections of everything, and he had these ventriloquist dolls. And so... I had to string them all up. It's the same studio we did uh, the Wild Dogs Man's Best Friend cover, which I set that picture up also. And I spit blood on the backdrop, and we put all the, the foam and the fake blood on the dog who kept licking it off, my ex-wife. And this time it was just me doing the, the photo shoot stuff. And uh, weird ventriloquist dolls. That weird one in the front was like an old, real-size head. And a couple of my friends were in the mass in the, and on the cover, Clyde Randall and Jerry Cottrell, and whose daughter is a Dr. Mastermind fan. She, uh, I got this message, this comment on a YouTube video on Dr. Mastermind. I said, I love this band. And I thought, I looked at the name, and I thought, hey, uh, do you know a guy named Jerry? That's my dad. It's like, well, well he's on the album cover. It's, she had no idea. <laughs> it was her birthday last week. I sent her a Dr. Mastermind shirt because, hey, she's awesome. And uh, so the music travels through the ages, and uh, we recorded the record to the leads and his vocals, and I think Pete Marino and another guy sang backup on some of the stuff, but it wasn't the, the Wild Dogs, Man's Best Friend kind of backups. And uh, the record came out on Shrapnel Records in America, Roadrunner in Europe, and their publicity department worked me like crazy. I was doing interviews you know, in the middle of the night with European magazines for months, and I was in magazines for months. I was the, the Christmas guy, the Christmas giveaway, and you know, it was really a cool thing. I really, I, I have a lot of the articles that I bought on eBay because people put the articles in my picture up, so I, I'd buy them. The one from Italy, and uh, well, well, I was destined to be somebody, but I didn't have a band, so we did one show. 
The record went to number one in Kerrang! for three months, three issues in the import charts. And, uh, but now nobody takes it serious because, oh, it's a project. No, it was a serious band. But I had given the drummer to somebody else, and Kurt James was in California. I'm in Oregon, and I'm poor, and I was broke, and I had no money. I didn't work. You know, I was going to be a rock star. And uh, they, don't, they just don't pay you to do this. You have to have rich parents, I have found out. So <laughs> I didn't live far enough out in suburbia to, to really be anyone. But uh, the, the name, how the band came about was... Uh, I was I had a little demo band that with Kip Dorn and this drummer from a band called Haven and we were I was writing my songs so I could bring the Wild Dogs my songs finished so we didn't have to you know, it would it would never have happened trying to work songs out like we used to because they were going to replace me anyway I found out so uh, anyway uh, they did show up we I had the songs and we practiced a couple of times and they just uh, weren't serious and. Uh, they weren't really friends of mine, you know, at all. And they were people I would not hang around normally. And and they would not hang around me unless I hadn't actually done something and did all the publicity and got the record deals. And But uh, so once the boat's floating, you know, oh, we'll just get rid of him and get somebody else in and, and uh, everything will be fine. Well, it wasn't, but... Uh, so uh, they didn't want to tell me that. So uh, I had a meeting with this potential manager that worked for Journey's company and he was out with Night Ranger on doing lights and uh, the first night uh, first day I was spent all day meeting with this guy planning out strategies for the wild dogs and uh, the band didn't show up that night I went to the gig with Kip and his friend and my ex-wife and we had a really good party time and the next night it was a two night show here in Portland with Night Ranger in black and blue and uh, the next night I went, and the band guys were supposed to be there, and uh, I didn't see them until after the show. They sat in a whole different section, and uh, we had front row balcony. It was great, both nights, and free. And uh, so we go to get on the bus, the tour bus, to have a meeting with Ken, the light guy, and I get on the bus first, and... Jeff gets on last, and as he walks on, he says, Hi, uh, I'm Jeff, the guitar player, and this is our new singer. It's like, you're joking, right? No, Matt, we decided to get a new singer. Oh, okay. So now that I have bo- built the boat, you all wanted to go fishing, and I have to stay on the dock. I said, well, I guess I don't need to be here with that, huh, do I? No, nope. well, I take off. And... uh I had a band called Evil Genius after that. We uh, Kip knew a, a drummer, Ben Linton, and uh, he had a roommate that I actually grew up with. That, uh, when I got there, hey, I know you. I am a court, you know, I'm like the guy in a Jewish neighborhood, and he was Ken Goldstein, and uh, I am a court. What's going on? And he used to have short hair, and now he has really awesome long hair. But uh, we all had wigs. So we made fun of the whole hair metal thing, the whole image thing, and so we bought the same Elvira wig, and made costumes, and we were evil genius. And uh, <laughs> we had a guy with a limo that would take us to gigs, and it was pretty cool. And uh, nobody wanted the tape. I sent it out to all my contacts and all my press people, and the people thought, no, we don't want it. This is, I think it might have been, they knew that we were making fun of the thing, because the music was great. The kit plays like Michael Shanker, and it was twin guitars, so there were some dual harmonies. The other guy, Chris Jacobson, the other guitar player, he was with the mentors, and uh, there goes my my connection with them back then, even. And uh, yeah, they used to go watch the trains with El Duce. He'd bring he'd send for El Duce to come down to Portland because he was living here with the, the guitar player for uh, the Vultures, that band I had with those two chicks. And uh, everything's so intertwined. And uh, well, it just kind of. Fizzled out, and then I, while I was living at the Ken and Ben show house, I kept getting calls from Mike Varney, and Mike was saying, hey, you know, this would be a great album, these are great songs, but they need to be polished up a bit, and I think if you had a different guitar player, it could really be something, and if you could get Dean to play on it, it could really be spectacular. And so, you know, once they got the word of that, it's like, they all quit, and uh, 
I moved to Beaver to become an apartment manager in suburbia with a pool. And uh, hey, I was at the villa when I was starting this. And uh, the villa, I also was playing at Mayhem at the time. And uh, the villa was, you know, a ghetto apartment. Uh, studios went for like a hundred dollars, and one bedrooms were one hundred and twenty-five. Uh, and there's that the guy that bought the building. There was only six old people that lived there when I got there. And there was uh, by the Within six months after this guy bought it, he went down to the parole office and put for rent signs up. So we had a ton of guys just out of prison. The place was like a drug dealing house. And, you know, everybody gave me, everybody, you know, paid their, their dues to the manager to let it happen. That would be me. They even had a crank lab. And uh, I was afraid of the place burning up, and I didn't want to go to jail because of somebody else's stuff. So I, I did call the cops and said, there's somebody that is making speed in one of the apartments here. Well, we can't just show up, is what they told me. We can't just show up and go in. I go, the guys are on parole for murder. The one guy was. And what he did was he bashed the guy over the head with a half-gallon bottle and then ran over his head until he had no head. And uh, he did like two years on that, and he was out on parole. (laughs) Yeah, it was a whole different world for me. So uh, that's where I kind of... uh, Rewrote a lot of the songs, and then uh, I played with Mayhem and then moved out to suburbs and was managing these apartments. And Barney said, okay, let's get serious with this. There's a few lyrics we need to change. And uh, like the Black Leather Maniac um, was about a really vicious killer that I heard about on the news. And he made it about somebody who saw the light of Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, the line, one of the lines was he cut off his baby's head to shut up his screaming. Because that's how bad the guy was. Well, I think the lag got changed to, you can't see the white light gleaming. And it's like, that's that's not even making sense. But that was the PMRC days. And so, you know, they would have jumped all over that stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't like the mentors, donkey dick and free fix for a fuck. But uh, Barney didn't want to have any of that stuff. Actually, it turns out that, the person putting up the money for the records didn't want any of that kind of stuff or any of that kind of attention. Might have sold better, but uh, you know, who knows? So that's when I redid all the words, and Varney said, okay, let's do this. And we did it and uh, went to California to finish it, and uh, it came out, and you know, we got coverage, and it was in Kerrang, top of the import charge for three months and every magazine, and I was like a rock star, but no band. <laughs> Dean was off with Tony McAlpine, which turned into the bad English thing. And, uh, well, the rest uh, is kind of history. We played some off and on gigs with different drummers with Kurt and uh, played a TV show. Um, turns out his mom lived in, in Vancouver, and he'd come up to visit her, and uh, and we'd do a gig. And uh, I've just kept the name alive uh, in press and, you know, with people, and I am just thank all of you for supporting a band and keeping the names of my bands, Wild Dogs, who sold 700 records of each record. And, I mean, it's not gigantic sales, so I, it's all up to you people. And, and well, I also help out, but I, it's really up to you that keeps the name alive, and I really appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I hope you appreciate what I'm doing. And, uh, well, it's almost been a year since I've had this this paralyzed face from Bell's Palsy, which I never even heard of before. And uh, so they keep trying to shut me up, but I won't shut up. It's only helped it. So uh, it's actually really good. I'm talking better than I have in months. Uh, so things are looking up. <laughs> uh, I'm Matt McCourt. I'm also Dr. Mastermind. And I'm also the guy in mayhem. I'm, so I'm the trifecta. And uh, so... Visit usmetal.com. I have stories of all the bands that I've been in, including Dr. Mastermind. It starts off with a really cool Batman spinning thing and the theme from Batman. You know, once you hear it, you'll go, hey, that's that thing from the Batman TV show. And, uh, well, it really upped my playing. You know, my uh, working with Mike is already, already with Man's Best Friend and then with Dr. Mastermind. It's like it raised my level from the dirty punk rocker that I was to way up here. And it's, uh, I can't thank him enough, you know. Mike was, I had a really great opportunity and you know, the Wild Dogs, as you know, 
just ditched the label completely because it wasn't big enough. And uh, if, hey, not my problem. But uh, they did a record that people like, and uh, it was a mainly a, a Dean solo record. But I have the solo, the real drum solo, because I thought that would be great. And uh, and I when I sing, you know, I don't sound like a bobcat caught in a barbed wire fence. So that probably disappoints a lot of people because there's a lot of people who like to see bobcats suffering. <laughs> I'm Matt McCourt. This is the Doctor Mastermind Story. There's more at usmetal.com. And uh, I'll see you later.